Hello everyone and welcome to the energy unit of Phys 1101. So we're starting to talk about energy and this is probably the most important idea in all of physics and it has implications to all sorts of disciplines other than physics. In the last set of lectures we met the law of conservation of momentum which is our first conservation law. And it basically says that for an isolated system, the momentum never changes. We say that's conserved. And we use this in a strategy where we draw before and after pictures, and we can use the conservation of momentum to write equations that get us information about before and after in terms of each other. So we can solve for things. We're going to use the same strategy with energy, although there will be some differences. So again, for an isolated system, energy is conserved, and so we can again use this strategy of before and after pictures, which will let us write equations that are useful for solving things. And so overall, what this allows us to do is ignore very complicated interactions and just look at what's, what's going on with the system before everything's complicated, what's going on after, and ignore everything that happens in between. So there is a complication here that we're going to have to spend some time on, and it's that what we mean by an isolated system when we're talking about momentum conservation, and what we mean by an isolated system when we're talking about energy con conservation is actually sort of different. We, we use two different meanings of the word isolated, to which you should say, seriously? I mean, really, what were people thinking using the same term for two different things? Well, sorry folks, I didn't make up this terminology. If I had made this up, I would have come up with two different words, but this is what we're stuck with. So I'm going to try and be very clear about which meaning of isolated I'm using, and we're going to spend some time figuring out what the differences are. So at some point in your schooling, probably quite early, you likely encountered this definition of energy, the capacity to do work. Well, that's perfectly clear, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. It just begs the question, what the heck is work? And unfortunately, it's going to take us a while to get around to defining it. It's going to be a little complicated to define. So we're actually going to start off working with energy um, with only a rather vague definition of work. And so that's what we're going to do first. We're going to get a, a definition of work that's good enough for now. And you're probably used to the idea by now that physicists don't talk like other people, right? You know, physicists don't use the word acceleration to mean the same thing that other people do. Same goes for work. The physicist's definition of work is a little different from the everyday definition. However, in some cases, it agrees with the everyday definition. So here's an example of a case where the everyday definition of work agrees with the physicist's definition. If you want to drive a nail, of course, obviously, you have to exert a force on it. But it goes a little deeper than having to exert a force. For example, this is not how you drive a nail. This will never work. I am certainly exerting a force on the nail, but I will be totally unsuccessful in driving the nail. And so you could say that although I'm certainly going to some effort, I'm not doing any work. On the other hand, you, unlike me apparently, do know how to drive a nail, and so you know that you have to get the hammer moving. And when the hammer is moving, then it is able to do work on the nail. It's able to drive the nail in. So apparently when you get the hammer moving, it has the capacity to do work. It has energy. Well, there's another way to get the hammer to do work on the nail, although I don't recommend it as a way of driving a nail, but here it is. You can drop the hammer from some height on the nail. And this just shows you that when the hammer is higher up than the nail, it again has the capacity to do work. It has energy when it is high up. 
for the hammer and nail example, then, let's look at, it, look at it in a slightly different way. How do we recognize when work has been done? Well, the hammer has to exert a force on the nail for work to be done. But we're also going to insist that the nail has to have moved. If you just sit like I did at first, pressing on the nail, and the nail isn't going anywhere, then no work is getting done. A force is being exerted, but no work is done. And this is going to give us our definition that's good enough for now of work. Work happens when a force is exerted on an object in motion. So you have to have two things happening for work to happen. Something has to be moving, and a force has to be acting on it while it moves. So now this gives us our definition of energy. A thing has energy if it is able to exert on a force on something while that something is moving. For a nail example, lets me do one more thing. And it's to identify that we've just seen two different types of energy. And for now, those are the ones we'll work with. We'll find other types of energy as we go along. Because we found two ways to give the hammer energy. We could make it move. And so this is an energy of motion. And we'll call this kinetic energy. We've encountered this word kinetic many times. It simply means to do with motion. So this is energy that things have because they are moving. But the other way we could give the hammer energy, give it the capacity to do work on the nail, was to lift it up higher than the nail. And so this is an energy of height. And we'll call this gravitational potential energy. Now a lot of you who've encountered this already in other courses will want to just call it potential energy and leave it at that. But as we'll see, there are other kinds of potential energy. And so I'm going to insist that you be more specific. This is gravitational potential energy. So a perfectly good alternate name for this course would be, how many ways can we describe a ball being thrown up into the air? So, well, let's do it again, but this time we'll use energy. So you throw a ball straight up, and on the way up, it starts off just as it leaves your hand, and it's going fast. And so it has a lot of kinetic energy, but it's low down, so it has not much gravitational potential energy. But now, a little later, it's at its maximum height, and so it's momentarily at rest. So at that instant, it has no kinetic energy, but it has gone higher, and so it has more gravitational potential energy. And so what we can say is that on the way up, its kinetic energy was transformed into gravitational potential energy, and we'll write it this way. Now on the way down, that process reverses. Here we are at maximum height again, and so still kinetic energy is zero, and it's got lots of gravitational potential energy. And as it falls downward, it speeds up, so eventually it has lots of kinetic energy, but it's now lower down, it, had, it has not much gravitational potential energy. And so on the way down, its gravitational potential energy got transformed into kinetic energy. That argument I just made, that the ball starts with kinetic energy and that is transformed into gravitational potential energy and then back into kinetic energy, is, you know, a nice argument that we might have a picture here that's sensible, but it doesn't really show that the picture will work. So let's now work a little more precisely. So here's our times. And now note I've made our middle time not maximum height, but just some time when it's up higher, and so it has some lower speed. And one thing we know we can do, no matter what these numbers are, is that this is uniformly accelerated motion. And so for one thing, we should be able to say that v2 squared, let me label this time as my initial and this time as my final and use UAM. So V2 squared should be V1 squared plus 2A delta Y, right? So Y2 minus Y1. And notice that because this is free fall, we know A. I've set up positive 
So a is negative g. Okay, and so I can rewrite this whole thing as v2 squared equals v1 squared minus 2gy2 minus minus plus 2gy1. And now, you know, I'm going to collect all my 2s on one side and all my 1s on the other side. So v And because I am picky and weird, I'm going to say, I don't like these twos. I'm going to divide them out. I, you know, I know that's going to result in some factors of a half two. And, you know, this ball has some mass, so I just feel like multiplying through by it. Right, so that gives me a half m v2 squared plus m g y2 equals a half m v1 squared plus m g y1. Hmm, that's sort of interesting, but let's just look at now, I'm going to relabel again, I'm going to now call this moment the initial and this moment the final. And if I do that, I'm going to sort of get all the same stuff. So look at that. I've got apparently this thing, I have got a pattern, a half m v squared plus m g y and whether i put ones twos or threes on the v's and y's oh look with twos it equals the same expression with ones and with threes it equals the same expression as twos oh and that's the same as that and so this all equals this so this expression a half m v squared plus m g y is a constant it's a conserved quantity. And so this is the thing we're going to call the energy. And look, this piece has to do with how fast the ball is going. That's the kinetic energy. And this piece has to do with how high the ball is. That's the gravitational potential energy. I want to be able to represent this set of ideas in one more way. Right, and physicists love charts and, and pictures, so I want to draw a bar chart. So I'm going to draw an energy bar chart, and I'm going to use it to connect time one, right, when the ball has just left my hand, with time two, when it's up higher and still moving. Okay, and so I'm going to note that at time one, it has a lot of kinetic energy, and it has not very much potential energy. At time two, it has a lot of potential energy and not very much kinetic energy. at time one, and I'll just label all those. And so here is an energy bar chart of this whole thing, and we'll be drawing a lot of energy bar charts to help us think about energy as we go along.